verses 14 and 15. If you've ever done scripture memory before, you've probably been assigned 2 Timothy 2 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handled the word of truth. The great passage of scripture that encourages us to know our Bibles and to be able to explain those Bibles uh, to others. So that's in our uh, selection here tonight, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Notice what Paul says. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Well, John Stott last time closed out our study with the following questions and answers in the commentary that some of you are reading. Yes. So why should we expect things to be easy for us or promise an easy time to others? Neither human wisdom nor divine revelation gives us such an expectation. Why then do we deceive ourselves and others? The truth is the reverse. Namely, no pains, no gains, or no cross and no crown. And we saw that last time in our verses uh, 11 through 13 of 2 Timothy 2, where Paul said the saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, and the context here is martyrdom, if we have given our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So those are the scriptures leading into our section for uh, this evening. The teaching, no cross and no crown. Now the crosses in this life come from the lost world at times, from persecution, from non-Christians. The crosses may also come from within the church from professing Christians. And this seems to be the case beginning in verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and going through a large section of this chapter. Uh, notice in this section, verse 14, Paul talks about church quarrels or church fights. Have you ever been in the middle of a church fight before? Maybe not a fist fight but people getting out of sorts with one another. Well, Paul talks about quarrels that can happen within the body of Christ. Notice he talks about false teachers and their doctrine in verses 17 and 18. And then he compares the church, and I was doing study on this uh, today. In verse 20, he compares the church to a large house that has honorable <coughs> and dishonorable <coughs> vessels. You see that in verse 20. And then he calls upon us to repent from that which is dishonorable and pursue holiness. You see that in verse uh, 21. So you see here in this section of 2 Timothy that life in the local church is not always easy. It can be marked by quarrels. It can be marked by difficulties. It can be marked by false doctrine. Uh, it can be marked by those individuals who, uh, who are honorable in the way that they behave and those who are dishonorable in the way they behave. Well, let me ask you this evening, if this is true, then why do we act so surprised when it occurs? You know, we have some pretty high expectations for the local church, and that's right, and we should have those. I don't think that is entirely wrong. Uh, but many times when we go through these things, we just get disillusioned. And we get disheartened with the church, and sometimes we may even want to give up on church all along. Uh, I encounter people on a fairly regular basis that have had a bad church experience, that are carrying a lot of pain from that church experience, and they use that as a reason for not attending uh, church. And I understand this. I've been a pastor for a number of years, and I can compare resumes with people that complain of the difficulties they have undergone in churches, but I do not understand walking away. I mean, if you have a New Testament, if you read your Bible, you just see 
that life in the church can be difficult. Sometimes the crosses that we face in life are created by the body of Christ. Well, to understand that, we need to realize that at the current hour, between uh, the um, really going all the way back to the fall of the Garden of Eden until Christ returns, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth is the church militant. We are in a war. We are in the crosshairs of Satan. The church is under attack. If you wonder why it is so rough sometimes in a local church, well, this is one of the reasons. And this is why Paul <laughs> says in Ephesians chapter 6 to the Ephesian church to do what? Put on the full armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And we don't think of that too often, do we? Church difficulty comes up and we just look at it on a human level and we fail to see the spiritual warfare that is going on. The church is in a war. She is under attack. <coughs> church membership and church leadership are not for sissies. You have to be strong. You have to have, have some steel in your soul. Uh, you have to have some backbone to be a good church member and especially to be a church leader. Now, a lot of this is interesting in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and also in Titus that Paul never presents leaving the post for these ministers as an option. He always speaks of perseverance. As we saw last week in our passage, if we die with him, we'll live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. One of my favorite passages in this regard is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. There's some evidence in the pastoral epistles that Timothy may have been fearful. He may have been an anxious sort of individual. He may have been wanting to run from the difficulty. Paul said, stick with it, buddy. <laughs> don't give in. Uh, don't uh, give up the gospel in this ministerial charge which you have. When you're in seminary, you get told a lot of stories, and some of them are just legend, and some of them are probably true or not so true. But maybe you've heard this story before. But there was a day and time that when missionaries went to the mission field, they packed their belongings in what? In the casket, in the coffin. The point was they weren't coming back home until they were dead. In other words, they were going to be faithful in their post on the mission field until the day that they died. No pain nor gain. No cross. No crown. Well, this is Paul's concern in our section beginning at verse 14 tonight and really going through the entirety of the chapter. How to survive as a church leader and a minister, how to survive as a Christian when church life gets difficult, when church life gets hard. Notice, first of all, the reminder that you see in the first part of verse 14. Remind them of these things. Now, who is the them? Remind them of these things. Well, he could be talking about the faithful men of verse 2. Notice what he says in verse 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men. And we talked about those verses a number of weeks ago and how Timothy was to take this gospel <coughs> and to, to pass it along to credible men, faithful men, who would be faithful with this message. Uh, these may have been candidates for ministry that Paul is thinking about here when he says, Remind them of these things, men whom Timothy was teaching in order that they might teach others. But secondly, he could be talking about all Christians or all church members. Remind everyone of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. So there's some uncertainty concerning the them here. In all likelihood, I think it is probably the former uh, candidates for ministry but know what is not uncertain. Remind them of these things. These things. The things of verses 
1 through 13, and primarily of verses 11 through 13. The principle that there, if there is no cross, there is no crown. That life for the Christian is marked by suffering and struggle. And again, sometimes the onslaught is external. It is brought by non-Christians. But sometimes the attack is internal. It is due to professing Christians. And there's no real need tonight to elaborate on this uh, too much because we have been treating it over and over again in 2 Timothy. It's one of the reasons that I chose uh, this book for our studies this year is to teach us how to suffer, teach us how to go through difficulties as Christian people. Life on this earth is hard. It just is. Don't listen to the prosperity preacher that gives you the idea that the Christian life is a piece of cake. It's not. It's not. This world has fallen. Bad things happen. I talked to an individual this afternoon. Unbelievable the things that he has gone through. This world is horrible. It is difficult. And God calls upon us to trust the grace of Christ so that we might be strong Christians, strong church leaders in the midst of difficulty, remind them <coughs> of these things, Paul says. It begins with this reminder. But notice, secondly, what I want to call the, the rejoinder or the warning or the solemn charge before God. This is very strong language here. He said, remind them of these things. Remind them that it's difficult. And then secondly, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. So this is an interesting contrast that he's making here. I think what he's saying is that as Christians, we can get diverted. We can get into some arguments that are not profitable. And the only thing that is accomplished is ruining people. And, and, and we must pay attention to this. Because notice the language that Paul uses here. I charge them before God. Uh, I charge Christians. I charge Christian ministers not to be argumentative. Notice the seriousness of this. Don't be contentious. Don't be quarrelsome. It does you no good to be a fighter all the time. And it only ruins those who listen to you. And again, this, this language here only ruins the hearers. Kind of backs up the idea that Paul has gospel ministers in mind here. Now this is not an easy matter to, to navigate when it comes to being a minister or a Christian leader. Listen to Jude chapter 3 where Jude says contend fight for the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, sometimes we have to fight for the gospel. We have to be argumentative for the truths of the gospel. Uh, we considered last week the passage in, not here, but in our sermon, and I believe in Sunday school, the passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says we are to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is within us. We must defend the gospel. When cardinal doctrines are challenged or denied, we must voice our opposition. We must state the truth. But some religious controversies are foolish and ignorant. Uh, quarrels about words. Notice what he says in verse 16. Avoid irreverent battle, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And then in verse 23 he says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. So Paul is calling us and calling ministers of the first century uh, to walk this fine line, to not be argumentative, to not get diverted into foolish and stupid arguments over non-essentials, but when gospel essentials, when the primary doctrines of the gospel are being challenged, that we are to defend them and to be strong in our defense of them. Some theologians distinguish between gospel essentials and non-essentials. When you think about essentials in regards to Christian doctrine, what would be some of the essentials of the Christian faith? Huh? 
Huh? Virgin birth. The virgin birth of Christ. Exactly. That would be one. Trinity. And then what is connected to the virgin birth? Trinity. The Trinity. Right. The inerrancy of Scripture. The inerrancy of Scripture. The authority and infallibility of Scripture. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, can, can you think of a, uh, a chapter in the Bible where that issue right there, Paul got pretty hot about it? Huh? What issue? We couldn't hear her. The gospel message. Galatians 1. In fact, Paul pronounced a curse on anyone that preached another gospel. He said, I don't care if an angel from heaven or anybody else comes and preach a gospel different than the one that I preach. Let it be that strong. That sounds argumentative. That sounds uh, uh, <coughs> because the gospel is essential. Lose the gospel, you lose your soul. Um, so when Paul says here not to quarrel about words, I mean, he's, he's not saying shilly-shally or to be wishy-washy on the essentials of the, of the gospel. But can you think of some non-essentials, things that do not determine salvation? What would be some of the non-essentials? Baptism. Baptism, the sacraments. There's different views within orthodoxy about these things. The church government would be another one. Eschatology. <laughs> Makes me shudder to think about it, all the different views on, on eschatology and how the Lord is going to return. Some people get bent out of shape about eschatology. Um, and the various denominations, I believe these would be things that we would not quarrel over. And, and we, were, we had a great discussion in Sunday school last Sunday about uh, witnessing to Mormons. And I think this would be an example of a group that we would have to declare the essentials to and, and challenge them when they are in error, but getting in a fight with a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness is just wasting time. No use to do that. Be calm, be kind uh, to them. Uh, but anyway, the, the rejoinder here, the, the, this strong language here, charge them before God. Don't get diverted into stupid religious arguments. Keep centered upon the truth of the gospel. Um, as you were in this context of being a faithful church member. Maybe you've heard the, the statement before, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. But note thoroughly tonight the requirements that, that Paul mentions in verse 15, this famous verse that I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, the requirements of God's workmen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The visible church needs workmen. People who devote themselves to the health and growth of God's body here on earth. In contrast, and I believe there's a contrast between verses 14 and 15, in contrast to tearing down God's people through quarrels, build the church up through hard work. And note the requirements here. Number one, present yourself as a model. Be God-centered. Present yourself to God as one who is approved. I, I love the statement of Isaiah when Isaiah was called. Remember what he said? Here I am, send me. I, I'm, I'm available. Uh, seek God's approval. Seek not the smile of men. Seek the smile of God. There was a famous Scottish pastor named Robert Murray McShane. I think he died in his late 20s. And he had this statement that it is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Christ. A holy minister is an awful tool in the hands of God. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as likeness to Christ. A holy minister is an awful tool in the hands of God. So present yourself as a model. Notice, exert yourself as a worker. Notice the language. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. Labor in the word and in doctrine, especially ministers. Acts 6, 4 and 1 Timothy 5. Wrestle in prayer. We can all do this. Epaphras was the example in Colossians 4. 
read, discuss, ponder scriptural truth and theology. Really go out on a limb. Find some open-ear listeners and test your teaching gifts. A worker who needs not to be ashamed. And labor with the second coming in mind. I, I, the second coming is not mentioned here, but a lot of times when in Scripture it is mentioned, this idea of being ashamed and is coming. Be a worker who has no need to be ashamed. And then finally, prepare yourself as a teacher, rightly handling the Word of God. Rightly handle the Word of Truth. You probably heard this phrase before, um, Denise, but when I was training to be a nurse, and I was already having my training as a nurse, and you start working in the hospital, there's a slogan in the hospital that goes like this. Uh, learn one, do one, teach one. teach one, there you go. Learn one, do one, teach one. What if we took that motto and applied it over to the Christian life about ourselves? You learn God's truth, you get some basic teaching gifts, and then you teach others the gospel. Learn one, do one, teach one. Well, the immediate context, again, is these ministerial candidates that Timothy is training, but I believe there is a secondary application to all Christians. We should all pursue teacher status. You see this in Romans 15, and also in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. I'm not saying that we will all teach in a ministerial role, in a public official role in the church. But nevertheless, we are called upon to know Christ and to make Him known. The specific application here is to ministers in verse 15. But I believe the principles apply to every single Christian. Present ourselves to God as people who are approved. People who are workers who do not need to be ashamed and people who rightly handle the word of truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, passage of scripture tonight that gives us such insight into the, the difficulties that we face sometimes in, in being your people in a local church setting, but at the same time, clear teaching on how we are to mature in our faith, we are to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be workers within this blessed body known as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be used for your glory, so that we might see your kingdom come upon this earth. And Father, how I thank you for those within our church body that, that get this and see this and, and, and labor not to earn their salvation, but because of their salvation, that has been earned for them by the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is appreciation and there is love for him and there's a desire to please him in light of what he has done for us. And so I thank you for the gifts that are resident in this body. We pray that you would strengthen us. We pray that you would grow us. We pray that you would make us a force for good in this community and in this world. We pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Next week we'll look at verses 16 through 19.